problem with all this is that the the like the mind learns languages much easier when they're young. But when they're young, they don't have a choice, and so you're kind of forcing people to do things against their will, or like without consent. So it's kind of weird. A little bit like a uh, gymnastics. <laughs> Because uh, kids are more flexible. <laughs> I don't suppose any ethics committee is going to approve that experiment. Experiment on one million children to see how many languages they can learn effectively between the ages of zero and five. <laughs> yeah, there's no way that's going to be allowed. But I am interested to know. That's not supposed to be that, alright. Or... We just invent a new... I mean, people have tried this before. Invent a new language. So then everybody learns two languages, their, their native tongue and the new invented language. People have tried this before, didn't really catch on. But this, like, uh, network effects, or whatever it's called. Like, if you do this experiment, with only a hundred people. Like, the, the language is useless if it's only a hundred people. Languages are only useful if everybody uses it. So it's a sort of... It's a sort of social, ex social experiment where you have to... <laughs> force your entire society to participate. <laughs> before it becomes beneficial. <laughs> Like it'll have to be a, a EU-wide experiment <laughs> where all the children in the EU are simultaneously taught the, the new invented language. It's not something you can just do a pilot study, because you do a pilot study, okay, you get a, a thousand kids to learn this new language. But they're not going to use it because there's only a thousand people, right? They're never going to meet each other to converse.
on a slightly related note. Like, linguists can decipher unknown languages from a text sample. Right, like the, uh, the, 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 um, what's it called? The Rosetta Stone unlocked Egyptian hieroglyphics. Because it had the same text in in hieroglyphics and, and Greek and also two other languages and so they knew Greek and they compared the Greek to the hieroglyphics and then just just from that they could unlock all the other hieroglyphics so the thing I'm thinking about is like what is the minimum amount of information necessary to unlock a whole language Like, given you have written texts, like, let's say you have access to, I don't know, a Polish library. The whole library is in Polish, you look at it. Like, how... <laughs> you could probably just figure it out if you had access to a whole Polish library. Just go to the children's section, start with the picture books, and then you start learning single words from the picture book. Like, you know, apple, bananas. You just kind of learn like a child, and then from there, you just build up a, a a vocabulary. The problem is that it takes humans forever to do that. Not forever, but a long time to figure that stuff out. Literally decades. If you want to learn that way, maybe an AI at some point will be able to just learn the stuff a lot faster. You just give them like a, a library of books from an unknown language and they'll just look through all of them start from, like, start from the picture books and eventually build up enough of a vocabulary to understand every book in the library like a, a picture book, a dictionary They'll just learn the syntax and they'll learn the words. I guess what I'm saying is instead of doing experiments on children, <laughs> which is probably not appropriate. Somebody should work on an AI universal translator. There kind of is in Google Translate. But maybe something better than Google Translate. Google Translate is a little bit rudimentary. Not quite as sophisticated as You might imagine, like like Google Translate. I think everything in Google Translate depends on having somebody teach it multiple, like the same phrase in multiple languages, and then it just learns from that. It doesn't learn by itself from finding patterns in a book, for example. Like reading through a book, looking through the paragraphs, and finding patterns there. I think it's doable. I think with enough processing power it is doable. I don't see why it wouldn't be doable. This Google Books, Google has scanned a lot of books. But there's been some um, copyright issues with it actually using those as data. You can search for books, but only like the first para the first uh, chapter or something.
but Google has like scanned the whole book. They did not allow to show you the results, except for the first chapter. Presumably, that can be data for AI to learn language. The problem is that languages are all like it's all signs. It, like the language is not the thing itself. It's talking about ideas or objects outside the text, right? So they're all signifiers for other things. And maybe that's what the AI needs to understand about language, is that the language is not, you're not looking for patterns in the language itself. I mean, you are, but at all times you need to be aware that the language is talking about other, like it's a signifier for other things. So the, the AI can't only take input from the text. The AI has to take input from the real world as well. Like you read a picture book, there's a picture of an apple and then there's the word apple. Okay, good. But you're not really, like the word apple is not a signifier for the picture. <laughs> it's the signifier for real apples, right? So I guess the AI would also have to understand the world before it can understand language. Wait a minute, this is too wide. This is six blocks wide, which is not correct. I... One, two, three, four, five. That's better. Did I mess up anything else? I didn't, right? No, I wouldn't notice. Which, on a slightly related topic, just kind of jump across topics here. I'm, I find it curious that. They don't seem to have tried training AI in the real world yet, and I'm not sure why they don't do that. Maybe it's just harder. So they like, they train AI on a chess board for example, and it learns to play chess, alright good. And also other board games. Google Alpha has also like trained AI to play video games, but the whole AI is inside the video game, if that makes sense. The AI isn't like a person controlling a video game with a joystick or something. Like it is in the video game. And in these environments, the AI eventually become extremely competent. But I'm not sure if anyone has tried to train AI just in the real world. Like give it a physical body and let it interact with the physical world through the body so that like it's not an AI inside a chessboard it's an AI in the real world I, I'm curious to see what would happen if they tried that just use the same learning machine learning algorithms and let it learn from the real world I don't know what it's gonna learn and I'm not sure if anyone's doing that Or if they have, what results they have come up with. Uh, I've seen one, I think it was a video describing a, a scientific paper. The researchers, they built like AI, like robots, and then they have a, a neural net to try to figure out how to walk with the robots. Like it's like a, a floppy starfish kind of thing and it just kind of flops around. And 
they make it so that there's a camera and there's like four legs, like a, a, a starfish sort of thing. And it learns to walk, so it kind of moves its legs around and you kind of reward it for moving a certain distance in a certain direction. But they noticed that the neural net was, as a side effect of this, was learning to recognize the researchers' faces. <laughs> Not sure if it actually helps the robot, but because it's a robot with a camera, and and the and the neural net just learns whatever, right? It just learns by itself. So it it learns to walk, but then it also finds patterns in what it sees in the environment. And after a while, the researchers noticed that the robot was recognizing their faces. <laughs> like the robot doesn't have any thoughts about their faces, it just notices that that's the pattern, like the, the eyes and nose and mouth, so they're alright. That is a consistent pattern, every now and then I see this pattern. So the pattern is inside the, the robot's mind. But the robot doesn't really have an opinion about it, it just it's just the pattern that it sees. And that's what kinda of what I'm talking about is when you put a robot in the real world, it will start to learn real world things, whether you intend for it to learn those things or not, because it's just in the world, right? So it's like <laughs> it's learning facial recognition even though it wasn't designed for facial recognition and you never intentionally train it for facial recognition. And I suppose likewise, it can learn a whole lot of other things that you don't necessarily intend for it to learn, like languages, like, you know, if you give it also a camera, but also a, like a, a microphone, Maybe eventually it will learn simple commands, like you, if you reward it, like a, like like you train a dog, right? You say sit, and you like make the dog sit, and then when it sits, you reward it. Presumably, it wouldn't take much work for a robot dog to also learn to sit. As long as you give it the right rewards and motivations. Sit and fetch. Uh, some of the more advanced robotic pets do that. So Sony Ibo is a robot dog. And if you like watch videos of it, the first time you turn it on, it will look around, and it will look for a face, <laughs> and then once it finds a face, it will record the face. <laughs> That's just built in. So from your perspective, the dog, the robot dog, like wakes up, looks around, and then it looks at you, and then focuses on you. I mean that that's kind of charming. All right, look, the, the, the robot's looking at you. That's cool. But what it's actually doing? It's it's recognizing your face, and then associating your face with your voice, <laughs> so that when you talk, it'll come, it'll, it'll try to find your face, and then it'll come towards you. <laughs> is what the the robot dog is doing. It's programmed to do that. <laughs> 